and we are live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this panel discussion on the third day of the Grow Your Art residency here at New England Conservatory. My name is Drew Worden, and I'm the Assistant Dean of the Entrepreneurship Program here at NEC, and I'm very excited for the conversation that we have scheduled today with our three panelists. I'm gonna introduce them to you in a moment, but just a note up front to let you all know that we would love for this to be interactive. So if you have questions as we're going along, we're gonna be taking your questions live. So please throw them in the comments and we will pass them on to the panels and uh, try to make this as interactive as possible. So I'm really excited to introduce our three panelists to you and then we're gonna jump right in. First, Anne Braithwaite is the owner of Braithwaite and Katz Communications, a full service public relations firm specializing in promoting the foremost jazz artists and events of our time. She and her team have helped to expand visibility for a myriad of exceptional musicians, including Maria Schneider, as well as organizations including the Montreal International Jazz Festival and NEC's Jazz and Contemporary Improvisation Departments. Mike Epstein is the president of Epstein and Company, an international booking agency representing award-winning artists since 2013. The agency works with artists of all genres, including Maria Schneider, and has developed a unique process for helping clients achieve important career goals by taking an entrepreneurial approach to an ever-changing industry. And finally, our guest artist this week at New England Conservatory, Maria Schneider, whose many honors include 14 Grammy nominations, five Grammy Awards, Downbeat and Jazz Times Critics and Readers Poll Awards, and the nation's highest honor in jazz, the NEA Jazz Master from 2019. Blurring the lines between genres, her varied commissioners stretch from jazz at Lincoln Center to the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra to the American Dance Festival and include collaboration with David Bowie. She is among a small few to receive Grammys in multiple genres, having received the award in jazz and classical, as well as for her work with David Bowie. A strong voice for music advocacy, Maria has testified before the US Congressional Subcommittee on Intellectual Property on Digital Rights, given commentary on CNN, participated in roundtables for the United States Copyright Office, been quoted in numerous publications for her views on Spotify, Pandora, YouTube, Google, digital rights and music piracy, and has written various white papers and articles on the digital economy as related to music and beyond. That is a lot. And when you see it in one place, it's really, really amazing. An incredible career with Maria Schneider. Thank you three for being here um, and for giving your time to us today. I thought a great place to start and maybe we could go Maria, Mike and Anne in that order would just be for each of you to give us a sample of what a day in the life looks like for each of you and your roles. Well, when I'm not writing or, you know, doing various other things uh, and I'm working as, so with Anne, I work with Anne primarily when I have a recording coming out, but sometimes when there's special events or uh, special things that happen um, and, you know, she'll probably talk about this, but it depends what phase you're at in or we're at, whether we're just getting started and kind of conceiving of what kind of project it is what a press release will look like. And, you know, so she gives me a lot of guidance in that. And, you know, I try to do my part to help her do her job, you know, and um, to give her good assets to work with, for instance, like, uh, you know, uh, great photos, because so many publications now can't um, afford photo shoots anymore. Right. Right. And so, you know, I, I can do my part helping her making that something that I invest in. And, and then uh, with Mike, I, I, there's, well, let's see, contracts and things, talking about gigs, uh, most recently trying to put together a big tour in Europe and me again, doing what I can to help him do his job um, by, you know, uh, giving whatever ideas I can and as much guidance guidance in what my priorities are would shift, you know, in time. And so uh, just connecting with him and trying to get back in a timely fashion when I get contracts with what I'm not so good at. But anyway, so it's just a joy to work with these people. They're so supportive. It's great to have people in your corner like this, you know, and we can talk more about the dynamics later of that. 
Yeah, um, well, Drew, thank you so much for um, you know having us and everything and Maria uh, for asking me to do this. And Anne, it's good to see you. It's, it's really exciting for me to do this with the, uh, the two of you because we've had the chance to work together for several years now. And um, like, as Drew was saying with your bio, Maria, I'm listening to it and I'm pretty familiar with your bio, but hearing it again, is just as inspiring as it was, you know, however many years ago when we first started working together. So I'm kind of saying that as a way to frame what my daily routine is like. Working with you is never anything less than totally exciting, and I'm always grateful for our relationship. But, um, you know, I would imagine, like, with most people, regardless of industry, it's always going to be what was my routine like pre-pandemic and what is it like post-pandemic. But I would say the one thing that's been consistent in working with you, Maria, in, in terms of booking shows is that because of the ensemble size, we have, we've always had a fair amount of lead time in order to prepare and plan a tour. And that doesn't really change whether it's 2019 or 2021 now, because you still need a lot of lead time to get 22 people uh, committed to a time period. But the interesting thing is that once we do that, and once we've identified when is the best time to tour, um, we, because we're so focused on that, we can, you know, I don't want to knock on wood, we, we're, we're pretty successful on um, filling in however many dates, seven dates, 14 dates, whatever. And I think that's an important point for um, particularly students who are listening right now thinking about gigs, this idea of blocking off certain time periods on your calendar in the future, enough lead time in the future we can talk about different organizations and how far out they book, but to get your head around that time period. And so I'll just give a basic example with the uh, Maria Schneider Orchestra, because the primary market outside of festivals is the fine arts markets, all the performing arts centers and things like that. Um, we're really always building around 12 to 14 months in the future for shows, you know, so that's important to think about today's date into the future 12 to 24 months is not is when the tour will happen as opposed to another type of artist that might just be on the road with a guitar and they only need three months lead time to, to get their foot in the door with a club. So that's kind of a way of uh, maybe prefacing what we can talk about a little bit more. Um, so you, Mike, that's it for, for you for now. So in terms of, well, I'm just trying to, I just want, didn't want to cut in if you were still. Yeah, sorry, I, I, maybe that was an abrupt ending. You can talk now, Ann. <laughs> oh, no, no, <laughs> my turn. No, no, um, it's, thank you, Drew and Maria for having us. It's great to see you too, Mike. Mike and I have known each other for a while now. You've been working with a lot of great artists as well. It, it's always such a pleasure to work with Maria because the quality of her work is beyond the pale. I mean, just amazing. Every, every time she has a new project, I'm so excited to hear about it and to hear it. Um, in terms of, I'm gonna talk a little bit more generally and then I can talk also about working with Maria, but in terms of what's, the day, what's a day in my life like as a publicist? And um, boy, it's, I'm sure Mike's is probably similar. And Maria's too, we're all jugglers now. We're all doing a million different things to keep going forward in the music. And, but in general, I see myself as a matchmaker between the artist, in this case, Maria, and the audience via the journalists. And via, in my case, I do mainly print blog or a lot more print people have gone to having blogs now because of the economy of journalism, which is not that different than the economy of music. Um, and, just sort of, I see myself as a person who's ma matching the music with the right writers and, and so forth and so on. So the typical day is that there is no typical day really. I mean, I, what I try to do every morning, I try and it doesn't always happen, but I try to sort of look at the big picture. What do I absolutely need to get done today before I dive into the email? Cause there's so much email comes in that you could get just drowned in that and do that all day. So I, 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 make my kind of plan for the day. Then I look quickly at everything that came in overnight and see what has to be answered right away. And, and then, you know, it might be that I'm writing, you know, I might be writing a press release. I might be editing a press release. I might be sending photos or looking at photos that an artist had taken to see which ones I think would be best for press. It might be, um, I'm setting up an interview. Somebody wants to interview Maria and I reach out and say, hey, we need to set this up. They need to do it by this date. Um, I might be responding to press requests for interviews or photos or anything like that. 
I might be saying, okay, Maria's got the CD coming out. We know it's coming out in five months or whatever. Who needs to get it now if we have, if we have advanced copies and it might be a digital advance at that point. Who needs to get it now because they're planning their issues far enough in, in advance? Because the further out you do things, the more likely you are to get the bigger stories because people plan those really far in advance. Um, and I spend a lot of time you know, matching the journalists with the artists. I mean, there are certain journalists that get everything we work with because they're you know, the editors of magazines and so forth. But otherwise I spend a lot of time really going over my list and thinking about that. And that takes a lot of time too. Um, I might listen to, a, you know, somebody sent me some new music to listen to. And if I have time to take on a new project, I listen to music and think about whether it's a good fit. Do I like it? If I don't like it, I'm not going to do it. If I don't think it's, even if I love it, but it's not jazz or, or in the genre that I feel like I can help them with. I don't. So there's just so much, I mean, I could go on and on, but there's so much every day. It's just kind of keeping up with everything and, but it's fun and it's exciting. And I love the relationships that I've built over the years with this. So I mean, really it's all about, we're, we're all part of a community of people that love music. And I think that is the joy of what we all do and connecting with people and in Maria's case, connecting with people through this incredible music. In Mike's case, connecting with people so that they can hear the music and me too, so that they'll hear the music in whatever form it is. So there you go. Thank you, Anne. Sure. Maria, I wanted to ask you, and we spoke a little bit about this yesterday, and actually this is a question for all three of you too, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your double album that you released in 2020. Um, I think a lot of students and alumni watching this feel that 2020 was a very, very hard year, and maybe especially to release music. Could you talk about what the process looked like for you, um, not only in making the music, but in also sharing it during that time? Well, I can tell you, first of all, the whole thing, my pain in the neck about this became Anne's pain in the neck and Mike's pain in the neck you know, because I, everything, you know, I wasn't quite done with the mixing mastering of my album when everything hit. So all of a sudden my timeline that I had given to Anne um, saying that this is when the music's going to be ready and you're going to have it to give to such and such magazine that promised an article. Suddenly that was completely out the window, you know, and and, um, you know, of course, she was anxious to get the music, but I'm, you know, was dealing with so many things. And then I had this, you know, quality control thing in my own head that <laughs> is like a little extreme, maybe sometimes. And so everything just went way, way, way behind. And then every time I thought I was ready, you know, somebody got COVID at the, at the CD factory. And now that it was like. Oh, Anything that could go wrong went wrong, but it, except for the fact that the the part that went right is I was working with great people every step of the way and people that were somehow patient and somehow in the, the year of the pandemic, at some point, everybody sort of understood this is just what it is. And if we aren't if we aren't all patient, we're not going to get through it. And so I was losing my mind and I'm sure everybody else too, but somehow we kind of muscled through. Of course, for Mike, it was, you know, really distressing to know because if my gigs are canceled, um, my band and I haven't yet done the work. I've, I've done some work in the preparation and everything, but the person who really did the work did his job was Mike planning the tour, getting it all, you know, dealing with all those people, negotiating, putting all those contracts together. And when that fell apart, it's like he did the work and then he wasn't paid. You know, we didn't yet do the work and we weren't paid. That's painful enough that what he went through was, was a rough one, is a rough one. So well, um, sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, there's not. You take, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you're being very humble and modest because the truth is, is you did a ton of hard work to get data lords off the ground pandemic or no pandemic right. um to get you know the orchestra together to get the funding together to do everything and then yeah i mean on top of that releasing it when you, but i mean it's easy for me as the observer to say this but i'd be curious if you had the choice would you still have released it when you did because absolutely yeah i was hoping you'd say that as, as it turned out, 
releasing it at this time for, for, on a, for a number of reasons turned out, not to say I'm happy about the pandemic or anything. I mean, the one bummer is a big place to sell your CDs is at a concert. And that that was gone, you know, and, and uh, you know, <laughs> so I have a lot of product. Um, but the thing is, is the whole subject of the thing, first of all, data lords with the with the sort of yin yang side of reconnecting with nature, all of a sudden, you know, there's all these articles about people needing to go on awe walks to reconnect with nature, to get away from the Zoom and the inundation and people being reminded about the importance of connection. All these things um, came together where the journalists that Anne was setting me up with, everybody wanted to talk about that. So it became so completely apropos. And oddly too, I think people had, this, this album is a big bite. Um, everybody will agree. It's in, in how many people listen to a full album, let alone a double album anymore. You know, people want these little small things yet conceptually, I wanted to do this project because I felt like it, it's what the, you know, the art called for. But in these times, I think there were more people that had the time yes. to sit and listen to a whole album. Yes. So oddly, it was, it turned out to kind of be the perfect time. And the sales through the site, you know, this site that, and we can talk about this, that I protected with my life, you know, the music and the content and the value of the content that I've worked so hard to protect making these two people's lives probably miserable sometimes has turned out to be such a smart thing because I was able to sell my music and I'm coming close to recouping a quarter of a million dollar album, which is not an easy thing. And so, um, yeah, the timing was great somehow. And I bet you'll recoup even more when you can get on the road again, because it's still oh, yeah. that album, you know, it, it's, not time sensitive, everyone's gonna want copies of that. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. Maria, I actually wonder, we're getting a lot of questions about um, the future of sharing your music and doing that on various streaming platforms versus protecting yourself. And I wonder if now might be a great chance to just share a little bit about how you do that. And what- Well, okay, like. so to bring both Mike and Ann into it, on the Mike side of things, he will know that when uh, Mike gets a request for my band to play somewhere, very often now, that venue wants to record and stream that concert as a part of the cost of the thing. And a lot of musicians look at that and, and you know, they've sort of been indoctrinated into this, this mind think that all uh, exposure is great. Um, and for me, it's not because those people didn't pay for an album and that recording that they make is gonna compete with mine where I'm trying to recoup a quarter of a million dollars. And so a lot of times it's, and there's clubs, I don't know what Smalls is doing now, but I remember when Smalls started doing that in New York, you know, where it's like everything was recorded and shared on the internet. And so, so there's that, you know, protecting yourself in a contract and saying, no, you can't do that. And having the guts to stand by your word when a big venue, like, you know, I'm not going to mention some, but there's big ones who have said, well, nobody else did this. How can you do this? You know? And it's like, because I can't afford not to, you know? And the same thing with Anne, she can attest and she, she can talk about the fact that um, most journalists now, you know, a lot of them now have, um, not only blogs, but then they have a, uh, what do you call it? A podcast. podcast. Mm -hmm. And, or they, they have a blog or, or even a, a news service, like even, or, you know, even NPR or the magazines, they're all online now. That's their presence now. Um, and so, you know, NPR isn't so much radio as it is online and, and magazines aren't so much in paper anymore as they are online. And they all want that music to listen to. Mm -hmm. So they all want to stream it. And it's like, and somehow it find it unthinkable when somebody says no. 
And so, you know, Anne and I had to really talk about this and, you know, because I want her to be able to do her job, you know, but I want to protect my work because I sell my work. So we ended up saying, okay, I'm going to pick a tune that's kind of a loss leader. Right. You know, this is going to be my, this, I'm choosing this song to be chum <laughs> or, you know, or, or the, the sacrificial lamb to give away for free, to give these sites content yet mm-hmm. not c- completely di- disintegrate what I'm trying to sell. So it's, it's very difficult now because you need that promotion. You need those things to find people, but you can't go over the line of giving too much away. Otherwise you, you lose everything. And then everybody knows you, but if there's no monetization to it at the end, what is the point? You know, I mean, the point is sharing your music, you know, that's great and all, but you you can't do your music if you don't make money from it, right? Yeah. And you got, you got to pay for the records, you know? Of course. I think that was a a great compromise was picking one track and letting that be the one because, and I think for radio with Max, didn't you have some that you gave like 90 second segments to? Yeah. So sorry, I've got allergies. Um, it, yeah. So in addition to getting Anne, I also hire a radio publicist, which I find is very different and, and are very important yet different. They're different worlds. And you got, you, you could maybe talk how you work together and what those both do. But so many of those radio people now are podcasters exactly. and they want all the music on there. Exactly. It's like, and then they want to put it on YouTube. So now, okay all your stuff in one is a one-stop shop in one place where somebody does a search and they find every interview of me talking about data Lords saying largely the same thing and the music all there. It's like people could have so much content. They could choke a horse, you know? So I really like to keep the, the things it's like, okay, you can share this if it's on your own site, but not if it's on YouTube, you know, it's gotta be, on your own site where people have to search for it because if it's so easy to access you're done no i i agree that it's good to keep some things back from all these sites because otherwise like maria says you don't have anything left to sell Um, and how many of your i want to ask you how many of your clients percentage wise um think like i do or are just starting to or haven't yet what most, do you even most don't i don't think most really just are so happy with any press that they're not thinking that way yet i don't think and i you know a lot of people they're they might be doing it for other reasons they might have a full-time teaching job so they're not thinking about monetizing as much as they they might be if they were in a different situation and not a lot think that way actually i think you're really the main one to be honest Yeah, I'm trying to wake people up. So the students watching this or professionals watching this, I'm telling you, there's a payoff. There's a payoff to exclusivity. Absolutely. One thing about exclusivity, you know, what Maria does, what you do, Maria, it's you, you're going completely against the tide, which I love because, you know, so many people are doing digital only now that having this beautiful physical product, Maria puts tons of time and money and energy into, you know, having gorgeous photos, gorgeous design, a beautiful booklet that opens up. I mean, everything, so much time and care goes into it. And I think that kind of thing really, I mean, it certainly really pays off because it's just artistically, but people, people are kind of sick. I think of everything being, I mean, not everybody's sick of everything being digital, I guess, but I love what you're doing. And also there's another Label. I don't work with them because I don't have time, but I know the guy, he's Nouvelle Records. They're, they're an LP only label and it's kind of like a club. So it's an exclusive idea of having this exclusive subscription only club and the LPs are very expensive, but again, they're beautiful. The artists get paid well. The whole idea is that it's part of, you're part of something bigger than yourself and it's not just another throwaway. And they, you know, they have, I, I think that's another way to go. Different people have different ways that they're doing things, but I, I like this. It's this. Yeah, I'm sitting here smiling. I'm sitting here smiling because I'm thinking about Drew's first question. What is like the day in the life for each of us? <clears throat> and my working relationship with Maria could not be more different than my working relationship with another, any one of my artists that I work with. 
And I mean that in a good way, um, because the, the way artists think, artist, 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 is, is actually surprisingly very different, regardless of if we're talking about two pianists or two trombone players or two vocalists. I mean, that's one of the things I really have learned to embrace about my job working with artists is that they're all, you're all so different in a wonderful way. <laughs> Um, but I would echo what Anne just said, which is of the artists that I got to work with, you're the only one who thinks this way about content and exclusivity. And I've spent so much time and money um, creating it. Why wouldn't I do everything I could to, um, uh, to monetize it? But I have artists who um, would say the same thing, but would then argue the point that I would rather create as much content as I can to get as much awareness as I can. And maybe some of that, maybe a small percentage of all that content, my music, my music videos could go into the exclusive exclusivity category and create um, a segmented fan base that way. And I've, and I've got artists who do that and it's successful for them. But I, I always go back to the, the um, you know, the context of the music and the Maria Schneider orchestra, that's so different than a piano trio or a, you know, a jazz combo or a rock group or a world music. I mean, it's just, it's one of the most unique ensembles out there, I think, because it's not, it doesn't even really fit into the big, I mean, yes, it's a big band, but we all know it's not like the Count Basie Jazz Orchestra, right? It's the Maria Schneider Orchestra. So I would be perplexed if you thought any differently, Maria. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, one thing I have to say too is, you know, when people are looking for an agent, um, it's really important to find somebody who thinks like you just described, because I think there are agents out there that would just prefer that everybody just be the same and kind of treat everybody the same and just have it be a kerching, kerching, kerching. But, um, you know, we're not all the same. And things also change over time as you get older. Maybe you don't want to take every gig. Maybe you just aren't willing to, you know, bust your butt. I, you know, your whole band is getting a little older. <laughs> there's just like a, you know, there's just uh, certain things that you start to need, you know, and you want somebody that is going to be there and go to bat for you for those things and respect that and not just see you like a work machine that's gonna uh, generate money for them, you know? So it's really nice when you have people that respect these things because sometimes when I come to Anne with, you know, my proclivities and this stuff or to Mike, it's easy to be like, oh God, I dread saying this to them. They're just gonna hate this, you know? Exactly. But on the other hand, I know that, you know, they respect it somehow, or at least they put on a good face. And, and, and it, it allows me to be who I feel I need to be in terms of my art and my marketing. Yeah, I mean, it's, an, it's, a, it's a labor of love in the best sense, it really is, you know? I mean, Maria, I don't know if you remember the first conversation we ever had when I used to work at another agency. I was the receptionist at a bigger agency. And the first conversation we ever had, you did a show with the orchestra in Boston at the Berkeley Performance Center. This was in the fall of 2007, because I had just gotten there. I'd moved across the country <clears throat> to be an intern at this agency and didn't know anybody, had never been to Boston. But um, I think it was like the following month, you, the orchestra was playing and I couldn't wait to see you guys, right? And, I, and after the show, I marched right up to you and I said, hi, I'm Mike Epstein. And you said, oh, hi, nice to meet you. I said, yeah, I'm the guy that answers the phone when you call. <laughs> 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 and, but my point is like, to me, at that time in my life, I couldn't imagine doing anything better. I mean, it sounds weird to say, but I honestly mean that. Like, I couldn't imagine a better job than getting to speak to somebody like you when you would call in and have to talk to somebody and figure, you know what I mean? Like that to me was like, yeah. this was worth it. So, so now that we get to work together in the capacity that we do, I, you know, I don't take any of it for granted. Mike, well, most of it. <laughs> Mike is also a great example of somebody who, you know, started at a company doing that, listened, watched, observed, learned, made relationships. I still remember you put together a tour for me. We, we, are, we are just doomed in a certain respect. So he put together this unbelievable tour for my band that was gonna be the Midwest, you know, and I was so excited we were gonna play Minneapolis, the Dakota and everything. What happens? 
Sandy, Hurricane oh, Sandy. Oh, that's right. I remember that. I remember, I remember oh, all, the, all the machinations of like flights and oh my gosh, yes. Oh, oh and it was just, Yeah, and and I just felt so bad because so much fell apart and you were kind of this younger guy working there and you were one of the agents. But I have to say I was so impressed with you. I didn't forget you because I was so impressed with your enthusiasm, you know, and 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 you still have that. Yes. Um, and I think that's so important. Like Anne was, you know, she loves the music she works with. Mike loves the musicians and the music he works with. And when you as an artist feel that, you don't just feel like you're just another name on a roster or something, but you really feel that these people are passionate about music in the industry. That is just gold, you know, because um, you, you want that. And so, you know, both of you, you would do a disservice in a way to an artist by taking somebody on that you don't really care for or whatever, because that is really a, an important thing. It's, I think it, in what we do, it's all about relationships. And I couldn't imagine working with somebody I don't feel, you know, I have huge respect for like I do you and, and that I like personally too, actually. Because that yeah, is, and it's really, it's that. very, it's very black and white for me, maybe for you too, Anne, and your, yeah. you know, your day to day. But for me, I've had the experience of trying to sell something I didn't really like, or I didn't really believe in. And it's very similar. I mean, you can make an analogy to a musician on the bandstand trying to play music that they don't care about, that they haven't learned, that they haven't, for whatever reason, it's just not, they, they clearly aren't getting it. And you can hear it right away. And you can hear it right away in the conversation that somebody is trying to pitch to a presenter about an artist. You know, like for example, at these conferences, when we're able to be in person um, and I can hear the conversations that are taking place, I can hear immediately the difference between an agent very passionate and enthusiastic about the artist they're selling versus the another artist on their roster where they spend five seconds doing to say oh that artist is doing xyz but let me tell you about this artist you know what i mean um it's it's very similar to a musician on the bandstand not playing with conviction and quite frankly not putting everything into it it's the exact same idea yeah. so i'm only mentioning that for students listening because i was a music student too and um there's other paths out there besides the bandstand you can help put people on the bandstand that's right. I want to mention for folks that are just tuning in that we are taking your questions live. So if you have questions for Maria, Mike, or Anne, to please drop them in the comments. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, I suppose, a question for all three of you, but for the students and the professionals that are watching who are maybe thinking, okay, I've been doing a lot of this myself. I've been producing a lot of music just on my own and I'm really hustling or juggling or doing the plate spinning thing. When is the right time for me to start building out a team and investing in getting some support in this way? And Maria, you spoke about this yesterday in our conversation with Ken Chaphorst about your first albums where you were figuring it out as you were going and calling people that you knew and you know you didn't necessarily have the team that you have now. Um, I suppose a question for all three of you, what would you recommend to students who are in that place thinking, when's the right time to start building out my team? Well, does anybody want to go first? I'm happy to speak about it. Okay. I mean, I can just make the, I can look inward and, and look at my own um, uh, company as an example. And so, you know, starting out just myself on day one with no support or anything was basically a product of, um, you know, capacity and the need for, or, or workload is what I mean to say. But as you go along and, and things kind of grow, right? That's the question I think Drew, you're, you're asking, right? Is like, okay, when, when really, how do I know when things have grown to a point where I just, I need help, right? And, you know, I'm very fortunate um, to work with a great, great agent named Marie LeClaire who happens to be Maria's assistant. And that's why I know Marie is through Maria. Maria, thanks again for the introduction years ago. I've, you know, I've always been grateful. But um, for a musician, it's not necessarily as black and white, I think, as it is for someone running a business. But um, I, think, I think if you're at the point where a large part of your day is, is being taken away by things that are not your art, so you're, you're, you're suddenly doing a lot of things that are not writing music or practicing music because you're having to respond to um, fans, you're having to respond to uh, uh, booking requests and stuff like that. I think that's really the key. I mean, 
you know, anybody could say, well, I don't want to do the, uh, the work of an agent, even if I don't have much demand for my music right now. I want an agent because I want somebody to do that instead of having to do that myself. But that's not really a good fit for the agent then. You know, because if you're at a place where there's just not much notoriety, it actually doesn't make any sense for you to invest in an agent because you're paying a percentage of a smaller fee that you're getting at that level of your career. Um, so, you know, I don't know if that kind of answers the question, but I think if you think along those lines, it's, it's helpful. It really is. I'll, I'll pipe in here and say that it doesn't hurt to do it yourself for a while anyway, because you learn a lot and you understand a lot then. Yeah. Um, you know, I've worked with a lot of people who did their own publicity for a while and then they come to me and then, you know, I have a wider pool of relationships and a wider knowledge probably. But I, I always tell young musicians, you can do this yourself. It's, it's, it's not easy and you have to figure out a lot of things, but it's really, it's all about relationships. It's all about, learning what the writers that you, you know let's say somebody says well i want an article in the boston globe or i want an article in downbeat well read the magazine find out who's who the right people are that that would that you think are the writers that would understand your music that would like your music and approach them and approach the magazine but i actually like working with people that have done it a little bit on their own too on the other hand if you do, you know, if you are completely overwhelmed and don't have the time and you do have the resources to hire someone, um, understand that it's a building process. You're not going to, most people don't get famous overnight. Most people in the publicity world, it's a building process. And I was talking to a client the other day, I've worked with him on, I think, six albums or something at least. And he says, he tells people that too, that it took us a while before he became more and more known because, you know, it's great music because I wouldn't be working with it if it wasn't great music. But it takes time for people to, to learn about you and learn about your music. So don't be too impatient. I mean, some people, it does happen quickly because it's just uh, like Majeski, I worked with Majeski Martin Wood way back and I heard their first album and I was just blown away and the journalists were all blown away. But, but it still took them a long time to build up their touring career and things like that. So anyway, yeah. I'm going kind of rambling here, but I think, I think it's great to hire someone when you can, but it's also great to do it yourself for a little while. Well, there's also another really important point, which you kind of mentioned, Dan, which is that you, you never stop hustling. Right. <laughs> and Maria right. can speak to that too. Like, you know, Maria has a team, but she works harder than anybody I know. Yeah. She, it's not that, you know, oh, you know, I've got an agency and I've got a publicist and I've got, you know, a business manager and all that. No, like, I think, I think the most, and this is true of any genre in music, pop, jazz, class, it doesn't matter. I think the most successful artists are the ones who just never stop challenging themselves and constantly, they're constantly asking themselves, what can I do that's bigger than what I did before? There's no complacency. They, the challenge of having to work harder than that time before um, is really important, it really is. And I've seen that with, uh, I've observed that I should say, because I don't work with you know major superstars, but. Maria, you're a major superstar. <laughs> I, I don't know about that. But... Pop artist is what I'm talking about. But you know, the, that idea that you don't, complacency will just kill you. So I don't think you want to make the mistake of you've arrived when you have a team. No, like if anything, that's just the beginning. Now let's see how far we can go together as a team, right? As opposed to the individual, but you never stop hustling or, or anything like that. Yeah, so I, I can talk a little bit about just like, how things sort of um, started and how I kind of found my way with this stuff. So um, in the beginning, of course, back then in the very beginning, like in the early uh, 90s, I had a record label. So the record label gave uh, some support to publicity, but it was in Europe. But I decided that if I had an album coming out, I was not going to not have it publicized. And I, I immediately said a priority for me is a publicist and and a, and a radio publicist because I wanted it on the radio. But aside from that stuff, I was do I was a complete do it yourself or I was doing everything and booking my gigs and, you know, doing everything. And I was kind of losing my mind. Now, at that time, I really didn't know what the, what's the difference between a manager and an agent. I didn't I didn't understand that. And um, a friend introduced me to John Levy, the great John Levy, who um, he's passed away for many years now, but 
He had, um, he, he had been the agent for Nancy Wilson. He, uh, back when she did that first, first album with that yellow dress, he actually bought her that yellow dress oh. on that album, Never Will Her, Never, Never Will I Marry, and that, that <laughs> album. Um, he played in the original uh, George Shearing Quintet and with toots in it and everything. So he was an amazing man and um, he agreed to take me on managing. And his wife uh, was Deborah Hall. Um, wow. And Deborah is, uh, is still doing it and he, he passed away. But they took me on managing and it really, really helped. And I learned a lot from them. And what I learned from that uh, experience is how nice it was to have somebody doing the talking for you. If there was something more that you felt like you needed, not having to ask for that yourself, because if it was left to me myself, I would, I always said I'd do everything, even though, you know, it's that Minnesota in me or whatever, Minnesota nice. And underneath, I'm like, I don't have time for this, but I have to be nice, you know, or whatever. And I was always doing too much. And so all of a sudden I had somebody advocating for me. That was gold. But then I was still doing, you know, the contracts and stuff, although Deborah was helping with that. And at one point, Deborah said to me, Maria, you don't need a manager as much as you need an agent. She said, you need somebody to get you the gig, somebody who knows these different promoters, somebody who's going to negotiate the money for you. And I don't think you can afford management and an agent. And she was nice enough to say, that is what you need. I mean, that's a good manager who puts themselves out of a job <laughs> to say that you need an, an agent. And so at that point, I started looking for an agent and, and I found that and it was amazing. But then if you have an agent, you don't, the agent is booking the gigs, but the agent is, isn't doing all the talking with the players, with the this, the that, the, you know, the, the putting everything together. The manager does that, but managers also do something else that I decided I didn't want. And what managers do is they help you um, think about your career and what your goals could be and, and how you might market yourself and what direction you might take for a project and helping you for, um, form your career. I didn't want anybody having their mitts in my career and the choices that I make artistically. And, you know, it was like, I didn't want that. What I wanted was really an assistant, you know, somebody to help me get through the things. And so I had, I've had various assistants through the years and then, you know, and then they end up growing into becoming road managers. Now, a road manager, that's gold. And the band loves when you have a road manager. And so that's what Marie then started doing for me is, is road managing. And now, and, and she became so uh, adept. And there's somebody who loves um, music so much that, you know, the musicians love working with her because she's, her passion is real. Her knowledge is real. And so Mike snatched her up as an agent. She doesn't have the same amount of time for my, for my assistant stuff anymore, but that's okay. So now I'm, I'm a little scrambling in that other realm again, but, but she does road management for me and she's, she's working as an agent and that's amazing, you know? So, but there's, there are different things you have to identify what you need most and, and, and then try to figure out how to proceed from there. Yeah, and I think it's important to mention too that if an artist has a manager, for me as the agent, and, and this is probably your experience too, we as the agent and the publicist are interfacing with the manager, not the artist. Right. Right. right? And 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 so we rarely, if an artist has a manager, we rarely get to correspond directly with the artist. And I've seen nine out of ten managers break an artist's career, not in a good way, like ruin an artist's career. I mean, um, and there's that one manager that I've had the experience of working with ever since, you know, the whole time I've been doing this, that's really good. And the difference, the difference is that it's not just that they care, it's that they, they really understand what is going to project, uh, push the artist forward, what's going to get them the most 
um, exposure. What's, you know, some of, a lot of the stuff that Maria said, but you'd be surprised at how hard it is to find a good manager. I'm sure. And, and some managers are good with certain artists, but they don't understand the MO of another artist and they're pushing that artist to do things that aren't really true to the artist. And I think in the end, all artists should be true to themselves. I mean, they need to, everybody needs to grow and, and so forth, but it, you can't, if somebody doesn't feel like it's genuine to them, don't don't listen to them. Either. I've worked with artists. I've worked with artists to that who then gets to a certain point. They get a manager. After a year or so, the relationship between me and the manager isn't that great. I get fired. Time goes on. The artist a year later fires that manager and comes back, back to work. Yep, yep, yep. I, I, you know, and I'm not saying that to inflate my ego. I'm just saying um, to your point and the the manager. In theory, the manager is the most important part of the equation because the manager is the CEO for the artist's career and interfacing with the publicist and the agent and the record label and social media and, and all of it. It's, I mean, I'm very lucky in that I had a couple years of experience doing that at the larger agency. I got to be um, Pat Matheny's assistance manager. Uh, and But I got to see firsthand really what world-class management is and it's few and far between, it really is. You know. we, we have a question that's on this topic that I wanted to ask. And just a reminder for those tuning in that we're taking your questions, so please throw them in the comments. Uh, what would you say about affording these types of investments when you're a young composer or other type of artist with a day job, creating music constantly, but also have to balance that with basic costs of living? It's, it's not easy. Well, here's, here's what I would say. I, I think the hardest thing for ever, every artist maybe is to, maybe not, it's, it's, it's about being honest with yourself about where you are with your music. Is your music, is, stupid term, prime time ready? Is it ready to get out there? Is it the level that you feel like this group has something, this project I'm doing has something and it's really ready to be out there. And if you really believe that it's worth that investment, then you then it's time to invest. But if you think that you can just hire people and it's going to raise the level of your work and put it in, by putting it in front of people, it doesn't. Matter of fact, that can hurt you because you put yourself out there with all this publicity for a product that is just not ready and it's not impressing people. And then you, you're, you're, you, now you've, you've, you've put yourself out there you and, you know, and now you have to overcome that kind of bad publicity that lives on the internet forever. So, you know, you have to know, and, and it's a very hard thing to say because some people are way too critical and they're geniuses and they say constantly and forever, I suck. And then the next person is um, thinks everything they do is great mm -hmm. and it's not really that great, you know? And so this, the self-assessment tools are really, really important. But here's the thing about having an agent. You cannot negotiate prices for yourself if your music at a, is at a certain level. That is my qualification, you know, the, that's the presumption. If your music is ready, you can't negotiate for yourself as well as somebody else can negotiate for you. You just can't, you know, somebody else can speak for you. Somebody can, else can ask those tough questions and, and, and do better by you, you know? Um, you can't do the publicity on your own that Anne Braithwaite is going to do for you. And so if you think that you've got something really special and then it, say to yourself, okay, that's worth the investment. Um, and, and I want to invest in myself. The question is, do you want to invest in yourself? And do you trust your, um, do you trust where you're at more than putting that money in a, in the bank or in a, uh, in, you know, a uh, S and P 500 index fund or something or whatever to, or into a piece of property or whatever, you know? And I've chosen, I've always rented an apartment 
And I said, rather than investing in that, I believe in investing in my music. I think the value is going to increase more, you know? Yeah. So it's, these are, you know, very personal questions for everybody. You have, it's, you have to be honest with yourself. Yeah. And I mean, when, yeah. sorry, I want to ask one follow-up question and then Mike and Anne, you mentioned um, knowing when you're ready and that type of self-reflection and self-assessment tools what does what do you think that looks like or maybe what it looks like for you are there specific tools or is it more of a feeling that it's your, it's your gut you know um and i've always been a very self-critical person you know and um but i when i made my first well when i wanted to record and nobody would record me and they said i wasn't marketable i felt you know, and I was walking around with all these cassette tapes. This is back, you know, in the 80s. And, um, you know, I, I decided I had, I had worked for years as a music copyist. And I decided to take 30, all the $30,000 I had and drop it on, you know, a recording, hoping I could sell it. And I did, you know, for 10000 I lost money on it. I gained in other ways. Again, that was like my investment, but I felt the music was ready. And when, and I got the greatest players I could that I trusted and they made, I was just talking with my bass player, Jay Anderson about the other day. And we were saying, it's unbelievable how that record came out. It was Evanescence, the band had, hadn't played long, but there was just a magic in it. And I, and I knew it was good. I just knew it was good. And I, and we just prayed somebody would want it and somebody did. And it was a good label and just so. Well, one That's thing so I was cool. going to say is a lot of people, you know, when you're a musician and you've got your music is a product, if you, if you step back, I mean, it's so emotional. It's so much like your baby, but it's also, if you look at other businesses, people have, people invest, people get investors, people invest in their careers or their, their businesses. And I think a lot of musicians don't think that way. Maria, you do in a, in a lot of ways think of it as a business. I mean, you, that's not the main thing, but you've got to make money for your art. And sometimes it's time to invest when you, and Maria said it when you really feel like you have something. I think it's interesting about that investment too, is that in the short term, a lot of people would say, okay, that is an album that cost 30K and I made 10K back. So I'm operating at a loss now and might see if that's your window, oh shoot, the album didn't do well. But I think what I'm hearing from you is you were on a way longer trajectory and thinking like actually businesses outside the arts do where they're gonna operate at a loss for a couple of years because it's an investment that they're gonna see returns on later down the road. And it sounds like you already had that insight and that vision early on of like, I did I, more than one of these. I had that gut feeling. I remember my mom being a little concerned, um, you know, that I put that money in and then it's on this dat tape and you know, how are you gonna make that back? But I did have this feeling that, you know, I had to do that to pull out of this, you know, um, rut I was of, of being a music copyist and getting my music out. And I just wanted to get the music out there. It was this feeling and that every musician knows that they want to share their music and they want people to hear it. It's not only business, it's business, but you want to get it out there. Now, those times were very different than things are now because um, you couldn't, you couldn't easily make money on a record like we talked about yesterday, the way record companies calculated recoupment and stuff. It was the rare artists that went into a profit on making a record. On the other hand, once you were with a record label, you weren't on a sure path to losing money like you are if you put all your music up on a streaming site now. You know, and so this makes everything very complex for everybody now because they're investing money in making recordings, but making your money back on that recording and breaking even is really difficult now. It's, I would say, venture to say for most impossible if you're going to exclusively stream, you know, so you really have to think about where am I going to get the payback? for this investment? Is it going to be in concerts? Am I going to do like we were talking about, protect a lot of the, uh, of the work, you know? Um, am I going to sell the music? Because this is another thing for me. 
I sell the music as printed music to different groups. So getting people to hear my music then pushes that. So you have to think about all the different aspects of your music and then decide, am I going to get a publisher? You know, okay, I have Anne, I have Mike. Do I want a publisher? I don't want a publisher. I want to publish my own music. But other people feel like a publisher is going to get their music in front of different bands. And maybe it will. Then maybe it'll get them known in the educational circuit and they're working towards getting that kind of a job. So you, you really have to assess, you know, what, what do you ultimately want to be doing and what's going to get you there? They're tough questions. Yeah, I want to kind of tie in what you're saying back to the difference between an agent and a manager for just a second. I think you want to dispel the note. You want to stop calling managers managers. Instead, think about project managers because uh, depending on the scope of what you're doing, it could very well make sense to hire someone who has the capability to take your project, your music, whatever it is, and work with you for a specified amount of time to see that to its end goal and result as opposed to this sort of catch-all phrase of a manager. I, 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 you know, I kind of, I think I want to take it upon myself. All the managers I'm working with now, I want them to start thinking of themselves as project managers, even if they are the artist manager. What's the project we're working on? And what, what are the goals that we're trying to achieve there? Because um, too many things get lost. And also, Maria, to your point about how do you, uh, how do you decide what you're going to do with your music with all these streaming services too, I mean, you'd be surprised how many managers are just not up to date on what is happening right now. <laughs> so I think you were very wise to invest in your own self-manager, um, your inner self-manager there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We have another question um, that is asking, do you have any suggestions for getting through the noise when trying to reach potential managers, agents, labels, folks to work with, especially because it's so competitive and oversaturated now. And well, maybe, maybe for all three of you, um, suggestions for that. Well, let's see. Oh boy. You want to find, um, like with an agent, somebody, uh, who is likable that you like as a person that you're going to be working with. You know, so that's something to ask around. Look at their roster. Are the, is it music similar to yours? Is it people that professionally are in, you know, uh, the same rank? Have you yourself garnered the audience to make yourself attractive to that person? You know, an agent doesn't want to take you on if you've got 25 people in a club at night. You know, it's like, unless... You are such a genius in the making. You are such a diamond in the rough that they just really see it. I mean, I'm sure Mike can speak about it, but I want somebody who I like. I want somebody who venues like, and this goes with a publicist too. Somebody who I know that, and I ask around, you know, I will ask people at magazines and reviewers do you like this publicist or are they a pain in your neck? Because there are a lot of radio people that hound, 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 and a radio station is just like, oh God, I don't want to hear from this person. And then there, at least this, this is early on what I um, encountered. Or, or they'll say, oh, I would ask the radio stations, what publicist do you like? Oh, this person's a complete mensch. When they call, first of all, I know they take music that I'm going to, likely like and they're not going to waste my time and they're going to be give me gentle reminders but not be breathing down my neck and i i venture and she's the same way you know all the writers and magazines they love her I, but now with an agent okay you want an agent that the promoters at the concert halls that they love but not love so much because if they love him too much it might mean that he's a softy or right. she's a softy. You want somebody who's going to be a little bit of a butt kicker, but still be likable because you want somebody who's advocating, but isn't a pushover, you know? And so you got to ask around and, and sometimes ask the people that are doing business with these people to find out if they like them, you know? And and so it's, you got to do some investigation. You got to be a little sneaky and figuring it out. 
Yeah, I mean, the idea of how do you get your music above the noise is that's a, you know, that's a tough question because it also begs the question, what do you want to do with your music? Like, okay, we all know that certain types of music are always going to be quote unquote more popular than other types of music, right? So yeah, I think you have to be very specific. If you're, if you're a jazz artist, I think you need to be honest with yourself and know that, you know, jazz musicians do not tour 250 days out of the year. It's, you, you literally cannot do that. There aren't enough venues for it. The audience isn't big enough, right? Um, so, you know, you, you want to be really realistic. The other thing I would suggest though too is take a page from the, from the general classic marketing playbook, which is, the, and I forget who came up with this, but if you can't be first in a category, can you create your own category? And that to me kind of speaks about Maria Schneider. I mean, she kind of created her own category for the, her music. I mean, I think we could all agree, nobody's music really sounds like her music, right? right? So um, it, the best way I can answer, how do you get your music above the noise is to be very, very specific about what it is you're trying to achieve. It doesn't, it's not, it's not good enough to say, I want everyone to hear it and like it. That's just not gonna happen. That's not realistic, that's not possible. You know, you're far better off with an audience of 400 raving fans than you are trying to get 4,000 general fans in the stratosphere, <laughs> you know? Um, there's a really great article, um, it's called A Thousand True Fans, that a lot of people may or may not have read or listening to this. I think it's by an, uh, uh, Kevin Kelly. And if you haven't read it, Google A Thousand True Fans, and it's kind of what I'm talking about. It's this idea that it makes far more sense to work on that very, very specific target market, target audience of very specific people who like what you're doing than it does to be a generalist, right? Um, that would be my advice. How do you identify a thousand true fans, you know? And then talk to Maria about how you can leverage that with artist share, because that's what that's all about. Yeah, it I said exactly the same thing yesterday. I'd rather have a few thousand dedicated fans than 500,000 or 5 million that don't, that, you know, want everything for free. Mike, I was just going to say, would you be willing to talk a little bit about Emmett? Because sure, absolutely. He's a great example. So Emmett Cohen, the pianist, um, I, I'm, I get the privilege of working with. And Emmett is somebody who has really, to the best extent possible, embraced the new paradigm of not being able to do live shows, but still performing multiple times a week, mostly virtual. And um, he's somebody too who, uh, who really took, you know, embraced this idea of true fans, a thousand true fans, and, and spending lots of time cultivating them. And maybe that means, um, you, you know, if you're listening to this, maybe that means you're starting with 30 people who are following you on social media and taking the time to interact with them but more than interact with them, like really giving them this unique experience that they can't get anywhere else through your music, through what it is you have to offer, right? And so Emmett is somebody who did that. And um, he was doing that before the pandemic, but this last year, his fan base has really grown. I mean, it's so ironic to me that his fan base has grown as much as it has in a time period where we can't do live music. <laughs> But I think what you're talking about, Mike, is building community. I mean, mm -hmm. in a way, I think that's especially when the pandemic's over, but even during the pandemic, what do people crave now more than anything? We're all sitting in our houses where people can't be in person together. It sounds like Emmett has really grown his community and is you know, really in touch with them. And I think that's something to think about going forward, too, is not just your you can do it in so many ways now. It's not just live concerts. It's not just online. You can do so much more now. So. Like, I wonder if I could ask you to, if you're comfortable to share a little bit about a tool that you shared with the NEC community, at least last year when you came to present about, um, you have like an artist growth process that is almost, I think a sort of self-assessment tool for artists to use. Would you mind sharing a little bit about what that is and how you use it? Absolutely. So you can go to um, our website, epsteinco.com, and we have a, a tab there about the our artist process, how we work with artists. And the funny thing about this is that the first um, professional business meeting I had with Maria, where we were working together, 
um, this was like in 2016, I kind of started the conversation with this, this um, process. And, it, the, and so it starts with um, a question where we ask, if we were having this conversation three years from now, and we were looking back over those three years, what are all the things that have to have happened for you to feel happy with your progress and your success? And Maria looked at me and goes, I don't really think along those terms. <laughs> like I was all prepared to have this great conversation with you and you know, we're starting this new working relationship and I've got this great question and I can't wait to hear how you answer it. And you're like, no, nah, that's not really how I think. <laughs> I'm not a goal, I've never been a goal, a goal person, you know, but, yeah. I'm, but a lot but, of people are, I think it's very valuable. <laughs> but the thing is like you are in your own way. So for me, it's been a fun challenge of, help you know listening to you when you have a new project or whatever and trying to figure out like how can we best get the results you want you know but back to drew's question um that's kind of the beginning of this artist growth process having that conversation and identifying all the things that are important and then thinking about of those th and then and then we break everything down into like quarter segments right um so we're always working in 90 day um increments and how do those big artist goals fit within that um, context? Which one of the which ones of those are important now that we can do in the next month, two months, three months, twelve months, and and to start thinking along those terms and everything? Um, there's another aspect of the whole thing that is uh, we call it the artist scorecard, where that's 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 a real self assessment tool where you can take the time to go through each of the different components of your career: touring, uh, marketing. Um, recording, et cetera, et cetera, and giving yourself a score as to where you are today, like an honest assessment, and then where you want to be in the next 90 days. And like visualizing like, okay, right now I'm kind of not doing so great on the um, touring thing. I would love to have a full calendar. Well, what is that really going to take? You know, if that's your goal, what is that really going to take? And how are we going to get those fans and everything? Um, so you know, you can go to the website and see it. It's all mapped out visually there. And I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, people might have about that too, if, if they want to email me. Thanks, Mike. And we have a question for you in the chat, which says, I have considered being involved in journalism within the music community. What are key points of developing connections with the artists and being a reliable source for interviews, promotions, et cetera? Well, in terms of developing relationships with the artists, was that the question? What, mm -hmm. Key points of developing connections with the artists and being a reliable source for interviews. Okay. Um, in terms of developing relationships with the artists, if they don't have, a, if they have a publicist, reach out to the publicist. I'm always happy to hear from journalists starting out as, as well as, you know, really revered journalists because we need people covering this music. And if you would like to be a music journalist, most of my artists are willing to talk to a range of people. Not always, I mean, sometimes they don't have time. They don't have time for somebody if it's a small blog or something, but a lot of people do. And a lot of people are willing to talk to you. I would say, don't be afraid to reach out. Have you written, you know, my question, I'm happy to have this person email me directly um, and at bkmusicpr.com. Um, I am, it's a little unwieldy. We started it way back when the internet was just starting. Um, but just, I'm happy to talk with you as well because we need people writing about music. But I would say, reach out to the musicians you admire, tell them what you're trying to do, tell them you'd love to write about them, you'd love to do a profile of them. It's, I think you just, do, you do it and, and work on your writing, make sure it's, you feel like it's really great writing too. But, but yeah. I'd, be, I'd be really happy to talk with you about that. Could mm -hmm. it could it be something for um, somebody like that to offer to help uh, musicians write press releases Absolutely. or something and then run that by you for, you know, to learn sure. to tweak it? Sure, sure. No, I've, I've actually, I don't, I'm not, I don't know what I'm going to do yet, but I've been thinking about more, how to do more mentorship and things like that. So I'm happy to talk with anyone that wants to be a writer or a publicist. So. That's, but yeah, I think that's a good idea too. There are plenty of people who need writing outside of print, you know, blogs and, and newspaper writing as well. That's very generous of you, Anne. Um, you might have a lot of emails in your email. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't have put it out there. No. I'd love to see more writers writing about 
music really. Just a, a note for those watching, we're still taking your questions. So please throw your questions for Maria, Mike, or Anne into the comments. Um, I wonder maybe for Anne or for Mike, are there any things you see from young musicians? Maybe they're still in school or they're just leaving school, but that you see as common mistakes or missteps, maybe mistakes isn't the right word. Um, did you think, oh, I wish more musicians knew this about the industry? That's a good question. Um, I would say a few things. One is not, this is gonna sound funny, but not thinking about your audience as much, just like, I have great music. And it, of course you have to be true to yourself, but also how, how are you gonna connect that music with an audience is one thing to think about. But also, um, oh, I just thought of something and it went through my brain, I'm sorry. But what else? I know that I know there are plenty of things, but just let me take a pause here and think about what I, I had something else to say and it just zipped through, but what other mistakes? Um, not, I mean, one thing is thinking you're gonna be famous overnight in terms of, I've had, I've had artists come to me and say, if I do this, will it make me famous? Can you get me an article if I go do this thing? And I'm, I'm thinking, wait a minute, you're coming at it a little backward. You don't be looking for the attention because you want the attention. Look for the attention because it's about your music and what's about your, what about your music is unique? What about you is unique? How does it all fit together? Who are you and what, how does it all fit together? How do you, um, how do you want to be seen? How do you want to, uh, what's really true to you? I think you know, think about your story when you're a new artist. Don't just think everyone's gonna love me, I do great work. Think about how do you fit in to the larger picture? Think about your story, what makes you unique? Um, somebody said, how, you know, why are you different and what, you know, how are you different and why should I care? I mean, I, that's a little crass, but it's just basically thinking about what, why, would, why would somebody wanna to listen to your music? And there's a lot out there. So you've got to figure out a way to differentiate yourself and um, find your people. And I think that's, I think some people come at it more seeking the fame than seeking them to be true to themselves. It seems like a delicate balance of um, being aware of your own story and how you would share that with an audience and still being authentic and not Absolutely. pandering maybe. To an audience for I think one of the things that I see a lot that's not necessarily the fault of the students, I'm going to blame the institution more, um, is that nobody ever really thought about how to market themselves. And it, like the photos are always an afterthought or the quality now that video is everything, right? But the quality of the video is an afterthought or the length of the video is an afterthought. I mean, all these things that are the first impression now that, uh, that happened before anybody sees you live anymore, the video, the audio, the, um, or the photo, any one of those three things generally is gonna be the first thing somebody sees before they see you perform live. So yeah. you've spent countless hours in the practice room making sure you can play whatever it is you can play, but you haven't been able to, you haven't been afforded the time to learn marketing and, and how to really do it. And, and I think you need to, um, you know, stop thinking about genres and just start following and watching and observing, um, uh, you know, superstar pop artists and ask yourself, why is it that these, like, why is it that Taylor Swift is Taylor Swift? You don't have to like her music. That's not what we're talking about. But like, why is she above all the other people in her category or Billie Eilish or any, you know, any one of these superstars, right? And then start to pay attention to what it is they're putting out there before anybody will ever see them live. And again, it's not about, you know, it's not so much about the music. We're talking about the marketing here. Yeah. Um, Why did they put something out on a certain day at a certain time? What else was going on in the world that resonated with a million people that they posted and it's, and, you know, got all that interaction, right? You've really got to be thinking along those terms. And we just, as music students, it's not part of the curriculum. It's not part of the aesthetic. Maybe it's even like frowned upon by the Grizzly Adams of the institutions, I hate to say it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that's the reality. That's the reality. Well, I'll just pipe in with one thing. You're talking about the importance of photos and now it's videos too, but I had someone get on the cover of a magazine because that, uh, that magazine editor was all about visuals and that person had a great photo and he, he could have picked somebody else for that magazine cover. He picked 
her because of the photo. It was just a brilliant photo. And it's really important to have that kind of thing. And even if you can't afford a professional photographer, look at what people are putting out there, get somebody, you know, there've got to be photo students that will take photos for you. They've got to be friends that are good at that. You, but I mean, it's great to have really professional ones done too, but sometimes you can do it on the cheap if you can't afford it. Right. I, I want to speak about this just for a second too, because working with Marie LeClaire, who we, we were talking about, you know, for years she has done videography, videography for me and she's very good and professional, you know, um, but a lot, you know, and we, we kind of learned over time how to best make videos. You know, we came up with kind of a way um, and uh, to create things that had some music and some underscore and me talking over some pictures and things that, but what we always try to do, I think, is give an honest feeling for what the project is, you know, and for what the people are. If you create a world-class video, but then when somebody goes to hear your group play, it's just, very one dimensional and it just, you know, and it just feels like, wow, this was kind of false advertising. That's not ultimately helping you. And sometimes, um, you know, I, you can do a lot with the little homegrown videos that look very home done, but they're capturing important little moments that are fun that tell you about the relationships in the group or what your personality is like or what little quirky things there are. You can do fun things that aren't expensive that can really speak out above the noise like your, your question um, said, you know? So you really, um, I think it's just so important to not do false advertising, you know, to try to, <laughs> It was like my last pictures. I was like, okay, gosh, I look old, but you know what? I am getting older. So what the hell, you yeah. know, it's like, it's yeah. like you That's know, right, Maria. no, but, but I, mean, I know what you mean. Yeah. You don't, you don't want to make yourself look like something else, you know, or to appear or make the group appear like something or make the, the, the production qualities feel like something you can't back up. So yeah. I think that's important. Yeah, I would, I, would be, I would be willing to say at this point in time, um, you are better served if you're just starting out in your career, hiring a marketing expert than you are trying to worry about getting an agent. I would, I would say that's a better investment. Like somebody who could spend time with you or work with you for a certain amount of time to show you how to produce quality content, you know, really quality content. I mean, that's, because again, it, just, it all goes back to that's the first thing people are going to see in here before they have a chance to see you on the stage. And that's what's going to determine if they want to buy a ticket, right? You would never, you, you, down, you, downstream, that's going to determine whether you want to be their agent if they start yeah, getting- right? You would never book an Airbnb if the photo quality was horrendous. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> it's that simple. You would never do that. <laughs> You know, I wouldn't follow somebody who purports to be a great artist whose quality of output before I've even heard them is bad. And one, so that's like, on the one hand, your job is harder than ever, but on the other hand, in some ways it's easier because it's so clear cut. We were speaking a little bit about this um, before we came live today about what some of the opportunities might be moving forward for artists. Um, there, we were, Maria and I were speaking yesterday about there's sometimes a feeling of, you know, when the pandemic closed everything down that, oh, live music is gone and it's never coming back. And it, there's also a, a different school of thought, which is like, we might have a new roaring 20s coming up where there's gonna be an explosion of interest in people wanting live music and more art and creativity. So what do you think, looking ahead, what are some of the opportunities for either folks that are already active working in the field or for um, students who are like, I'm just about to launch this career in music? What, what do you think the future looks like? I got a lot of thoughts, but maybe I'll let someone else go first. <laughs> go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Well, so nobody knows what the future is going to hold. You know, we just don't know. We could, we could all be vaccinated a year from now and another pandemic could come out and, and we would have to deal with that. We just don't know. So 
I love the, the saying that the best way to predict the future is to invent it for yourself and just start with that premise, <laughs> you know? Now, I mean, if you're a musician, what opportunities are available if you, for you right now? Well, obviously live performances are not, that's not happening right now. Unless you want to take a risk and go perform in Texas, you're welcome to do that. <laughs> we're personally not going to send any of our artists down there right now. But um, I do think we're going to see, I, I think my prediction is the next 12 to 18 months are going to be a heyday for local artists. Yes. Be the reason being that as things are opening up, the capacities are so limited you can only have 25 people spaced out or 50 people spaced out indoors or whatever that number is so limited that it, it's not affordable for an artist to fly across the country to go play at that venue right now. But, um, you know, for local musicians in your community and your scene, I think it's, it's going to be a huge explosion. And I think that's a really good thing because it's going to ultimately inform the national scene, if that makes sense, you know, so Pre-pandemic, right? It's next to impossible if I'm a if I'm a local musician to get a great gig in another state that I, or city that I've never been in. But because you're going to have a very specific amount of time, whether it's 12 months, 18 months, or longer, um, to build a local audience, I think you want to you know think along those terms. And then maybe it branches out a little bit, right? So if you're a local musician in Boston, uh, eventually you know the uh, going down to New York right? You're going to be able to do that again, and you're going to be doing regional tours, and it's going to hopefully get bigger and bigger. Um, I think, I just think the, the heyday of the local musician, local artist is a big thing right now. And, and these local musicians are going to have opportunities to perform at major venues that are local to them that they wouldn't have otherwise had. I could be wrong, but I, I just think that's going to happen. That's interesting. You know, you're talking about opportunities in performing I was talking to Henry who runs Andy Music down in Baltimore the other day, and he was saying that he's all about, he's, I don't know if it's a nonprofit, but it's almost like that. He's all about helping support the artists. And he said streaming in the last year has brought in as much revenue as the live concerts had in before. So he's, I think he's gonna keep doing both live and streaming when they, when they can go back. And I think uh -huh. a lot of people I think there are some opportunities with streaming that um, for a lot of artists that might really make their audience grow bigger too, especially if you're working with a venue. I mean, his, you know, I had never seen, I work with a pianist called Lafayette Gilchrist, who's a, based in Baltimore. He, I'd never seen him live. And I, during the pandemic, one of the, you know, advantages, if you can say, I mean, I'd like to see him live and I will someday, but I was able to attend a concert at Andy Music and, and see him live. And, and I was talking to them about, you know, the audience and it's all over the world now. So I think there may be, you know, even though the digital world is tricky as Maria will definitely attest to, it's also offers some opportunities if you use them wide, wisely and don't give away your music too much. Anymore, so. Well, the, the Metropolitan Opera was doing that, you know, with all their, there's, there's streaming and, and movies and whatever of opera and even before the pandemic, you know, and, wow. and that model worked really well for them. And I think, yeah, it will be some kind of mixture for yeah. a lot of places. But I do think, like I said yesterday, Drew, I, I do think when people have the chance to hear live music and connect oh, yeah. in person, they are going to feel like, oh, I mean, I know I am going to just love going and hearing musicians. And I know musicians are going to be appreciating their audiences yes. like never before, which is going to make it even more exciting to hear live music. I agree with you. I think the thing that's really missing from live streaming is the the feeling that both, of me, I assume the musicians and the audience get of the energy going back and forth and these mm -hmm. amazing moments. You, it's weird to watch things that are silent and I, I can't wait. I think there's gonna be a renaissance of culture after all of this. I hope anyway, I think so. Yeah, I think uh, something, something good will come from it, you know. Is that I feel, I'm feeling so like I, I want you to say something. I just want to say I'm feeling so lucky that I get to work with these people just hearing you both speak. Oh, uh, well, we, I feel lucky to work with you, Maria, and Mike, too. Mike, I'm always so impressed by Mike because he's got such a great broad vision of the industry. And I'm like, does. Wow, how does he keep up with all that? I got to follow him more. Well, that's really kind of you to say. I feel that's the same true. way about you guys. Uh, <laughs>
Um, we might be coming towards a good place to close. I want to ask you one or two more questions before we wrap up. And Maria, maybe this first one could come to you, but I wonder, we spoke yesterday and you shared a little bit about what it was like when you were testifying to Congress about intellectual property and digital rights. And you even mentioned being like next to a lawyer from YouTube at one point during that. I wonder if you could, one, be willing to share a little bit about that, um, not necessarily to rehash what you just already spoke about yesterday, but a little bit about what that experience was like for you. And then two, do you think that there's a way to do streaming right in the future? Is there a way um, where artists can be paid fairly and to grow their audiences, maybe using the existing models, but maybe even some future that we were even talking before we went live here about cryptocurrencies and blockchain and all that. But what do you think, is there a way to do this right? Yeah, I wish I knew more about that to, to comment on that, but I do have idea, uh, two ideas that would be wonderful for streaming. So the, for me, the, the, the two problems I have with streaming are, one, we live in a free market economy, but for music, there's no free market. You know, if you're streaming, you're all paid the same. It's the amount that uh, uh, one stream or one listen plays. And it doesn't matter if you're the kid that made music in your bedroom on your Mac computer, or you're me who spent $250,000. You know, that's anti-free market. That's ridiculous. There's no nothing else in our world that uh, in this country, cl from clothing to food to anything, you're allowed to have specialty, make specialty furniture and you charge more for it for a smaller group. So I feel just like on Amazon, when you go to see a movie and some movies you have to pay more for and some are just in with your, your Amazon Prime, we should in these niche markets be able to set our own price on Spotify that yes, you can listen to my music for free or no, these pieces you have to pay this much and that people can set their own price and let the market bear out what, what happens with that. And then, um, I mean, there's other things too, but another thing is I have a real problem when people buy on my website, I know who they are and I can contact those people. Imagine if on Apple music, for instance, um, I, somebody streams my music that they, that there would be a box that they can click allowing the artist to know who you are and what that would enable me to do it's like hey apple why don't you help us help you because if if you know you're if you're super fans that you're you know purporting to help me find or on spotify or whatever if i can know who they are and then go to them and say hey, I'm doing a new project on Artist Share, and you can be a part of it and get all this extra stuff or you know, documentation or whatever and come in on these different levels and be, you know, uh, you know, have your name on the album or whatever it is, then that would help me pay for these records that they are not helping me pay for. And then I have content, now there's a reason for me to be on Spotify on Apple, because now you've got this sort of tribe mentality, the discovery tools, the everything, and everybody finds the music. If I can access them in that way and then bring them into my world, now there's a reason for me maybe to do that. So, you know, I, and just like Mike was saying, and, and Anne was both, we're both saying, I mean, they have these very bright clients who are, experienced in the world and nobody is advocating the way I am. Sometimes I feel like it's, it's, I feel like I'm in the land of the Stepford wives or, or the brain dead, walking dead. We go, we stream here, take our music. Wow. This looks kind of cool with the, with the <laughs> I look like I'm in the walking dead right now, you know, and just accepting that this is how it should be. And it's not, and it, it's, and you feel like this person, you know, and in, in these, these, you know, these big people that are running the streaming world, they're looking at the pop, the pop artists, you know? Um, I talked to somebody who manages one of the most famous musicians I, the world has ever known the other day. And when I described my issues on YouTube, he said, 
oh my God, that never even occurred to me. It's like, yeah, of course, because you're right. dealing in the, the hundreds of millions of dollars on this artist. But the truth is we make up the mass majority of what music is. We are the cult culture setters. We are the, well, not me, but the Pulitzer Prize winners, the MacArthur winners. We are the people that, you know, are so important to the music. We are the 90% of music that is splitting less than 1% of the financial pie on Spotify. It's so utterly absurd. And sometimes that I find myself one of the few people out there saying, hello, this is not enough. This cannot sustain itself. It is going to eventually affect the quality of music. Yes. You are going to have musicians coming out of schools like New England and Eastman that say, I can't do it. I don't want to do it. I'm going to do something else. And that's not right. So, you know, when I fight for these things, it's not because, you know, it's not only for me and my music that's been shared, it's for all of us. Because if we all fight to change what this world looks like, you know, then we have a voice. If those 99 or 90% scream bloody murder as much as I do, we would not be in this mess, you know? So it's like, and people ask, what can I do? It's like, well, you got to get educated about it. Yesterday, I gave some tools, you know, sign up on Ask App Daily Brief. You'll learn a little bit. There'll be some articles every day. Slowly, you'll learn. And if you learn, you're going to get mad as a hatter, just like I am. <laughs> okay, enough. <laughs> this is wonderful. Thank you. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're only partly joking. <laughs> Um, well, I did ask kind of a series of nested questions, which I think Maria answered brilliantly. Um, but I was curious of with the existing platforms that exist, which in my work at NEC, I hear a lot from students, they don't feel that they have any alternatives, that I, we have to be on there. I don't know what else to do, at least initially. Um, but with the existing platforms, is there a way to do streaming right if there were some changes that were made? Yeah, I mean, Maria definitely can speak better about it than I can. Um, yeah, I mean, she laid it out pretty clearly. The, the, you know, the idea that we all pay, what is it, $10 or $12 a month, you, you know, flat for all the music in the world, which is not created equally, is a complete disparity. It is. And I mean, I'm guilty as charged, right? I have Spotify on all day. Maria, when are you going to get your albums on Spotify? Uh, well, you know, I have, I have Sputnik on there. I have my one, my one, uh, what do you call oh, it? No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I don't, I think I, as I was listening to Maria describe the problems and the challenges, I'm thinking of the boxes and boxes of CDs I have in my closets here in our house. And you know, I'm thinking about if I woke up tomorrow, streaming services were gone, and my only option was to spend $15 or $20 or whatever it was um, on a record, physically, how would I react to that, right? Like, would people take to the streets? I don't know. Would there be less music bought? I don't know. But that wasn't that long ago, <laughs> you know? Um, now, truth be told, that also wasn't the best uh, situation for artists either, you know? and you can read into the whole history of payola and, and uh, uh, royalties going directly to the record label and not the artist, you know? So that wasn't the best model either, right? So there really hasn't, it's not just what's a better model than the current streaming systems. It's like, what is an actually good model for musicians to get paid for recorded music? We really haven't ever seen one. It, what I'll say just as an answer to that though, um, and it, we talked a little bit about it yesterday, is the difference was that back with record companies, the record companies were taking on the financial investment for the record. So if the rec, and only one out of 12 really made their money back. So if your record bombed, you know, you weren't losing, you know, your, your savings or your down payment on your house it was the record company making the investment. And for that, they reaped huge profits and did they take too much? And did they sometimes, not all, get greedy? Yes, they did. But now we're in a situation where these record companies largely are not paying 
for the budget of the record. And, um, and people are putting on these streaming sites with no chance of making their investment back. So they're losing all that money. And that's, that's, that's why I always say, we people, you know, like these students that are putting their stuff up, stuff up on Spotify, they are subsidizing by paying for their records and getting grants and things. They are essentially subsidizing Spotify and YouTube. I, I had a friend in Norway. I look like I'm in Norway right now. I had a friend in Norway and he said, well, in Norway, we're so lucky, you know, we have a lot of, you know, the economy's great and we have cultural organizations that help us pay for our records. And I said, really? Yeah, and your taxes pay for that. How do you feel about your taxes subsidizing Spotify and YouTube? You know, because I don't think that's right, you know? So anyway, I, I do wish people... Um, you, you know, one thing I will say that's a very interesting thing for everybody to watch, and, um, and I, I subscribe to papers in the UK, both The Guardian and The London Times, because in Europe, there is so much more of a conversation about big data companies, tech companies, Spotify. The UK just did a huge study where people could write in their opinions on Spotify, and I worked with some musicians in the UK and gave them my what I basically just said, and uh, things are changing. Look at Australia; just decided in speaking of journalism that they will not allow journalism, you, you know, companies like Google and Facebook to not pay journalists, and Google threatened to leave um, and, and basically go dark in Australia. And Microsoft came, if I might be portraying this not exactly right. So this is with that qualification, Microsoft came in and said, hey, we'll do it, you know? And, and, um, and all of a sudden now Google says, oh, okay, we will. But Facebook just took down um, uh, articles and now they're being criticized because with that, they right. took down information on how to get the the the, wow. the immunizations and everything else. And so, but what I love is there are some countries, there are some, you know, uh, higher ups in the EU and stuff that are starting to say we've had enough. Right. They're they're about two decades too late. But anyway, you know, we're we're getting there. So, Maria, what do you think it would? take for it to work in the music industry in that way so say that you know the musicians get educated and 90 percent of the folks that are on spot they're like i get it i'm on board what do you think it would take to affect change is it from, from the business or from the people from your artists well both well artists starting to uh scream at spotify start starting to talk about the free market you know why this isn't right that I can't set my price. Um, artists starting to say to YouTube, this isn't right that I can't have the tools just to block, block uploads of my music so that I can protect my own marketplace and make a decision proactively. You know, you've got the tools, you're using it, giving it to everybody to use for monetization and the big guys get it to take it down. But for the masses, the, you know, all of us, who collectively contribute a lot of content to YouTube, but individually it may be little bits. We're treated like, you know, like it doesn't matter. You know, somehow we should be happy because we got 700 more fans. But like you, to your point, Mike, those 700 people actually paying for our music on our own site are hugely valuable, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, I just, you, you remind me of something totally relevant, but uh, generally my experience, my humble experience has been artists have a say in the price of their ticket to a show. Yes. The promoter might not always agree to it. There might be a negotiation, but if a promoter wants to charge a hundred dollars per ticket for something that, I mean, that is clearly too high, where it, let's just say for the sake of example, it should be like $50. You know, there's that room to push back and to find a happy medium. Uh, when it comes to the live show. So hearing you talk about this idea that, you know, artists can't advocate for the price of their own music online. I mean, it is, it's just amazing that you can't do that. And I can't, I can't imagine your frustration. 
And when you have the CEO, Daniel Eck of Spotify saying, well, the answer is you just have to make more music. Oh. Oh, yeah, isn't they a thank you for that oh, reaction? God. That's about what every musician said. It's oh. like, excuse me, had enough of you, buddy. You know? <laughs> it's oh like, my goodness. So, you know, it's really, um, so I think if everybody started talking about it and started saying, yeah, I don't want to put all my music up. I just want to put up a little thing. And yeah, you know what? You can't put up my, my music and my podcasts up on YouTube. I don't want it there. I, this is diluting my market, you know? And if people started protecting themselves in mass, it would change things. You know, these companies would have to start saying, okay, you know, or if I would love to see somebody start a streaming company with complete transparency and you set your own price, <laughs> you know? If 5G might ch start to change things when people can start streaming their own music, you know, on their own platforms and then, you know, maybe charging and maybe there's gonna be some platform that allows people to have their stuff uh, accessed in some kind of hub. I don't know, yeah. but something's gotta change. Cause mm -hmm. you know, and I, hey, I agree. I love the convenience. I got Spotify, you know, by the way, you can get Spotify for free if you watch ads and not pay a single thing. Mm -hmm. I of course pay for it. And I love the convenience of being able to get everything up. But you know what, if, if somebody had on there, you know, that you can do these uh, uh, payments and have it come up at the end of the month, I would be willing to do that, you know? And some music I wouldn't, you know, mm -hmm. fine. <laughs> the artists can decide, you know, if they need to lower their price or not. That's right. Well, thank you, um, all three of you, Maria, Mike, and Anne. Before we wrap, I wonder, do you have any last thoughts or ideas that you want to share with the audience? Um, could be advice for students or things that you want to keep them in mind. Oh, I think I pretty much said it all. I, can, I think that's the first time I ever said that in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I don't think of anything new else to say either. Just be true to yourself and think about community and think about, I don't know, that's all. Yeah, I mean, if anybody has any specific questions about touring or, you know, live shows, I'm happy to, you can feel free to share my email address through. Thank you know, you. just one thing, and this is just an obvious thing, and I, you guys will all say it, but you know what, you're, in the end, um, it's important to, well, first of all, keep your quality of everything high in, in your music and everything, but then being a nice person, you know, mm -hmm. being respectful to the people you work with, you know, and, and being, I know for me, who do I wanna work with? I wanna work with nice people. I don't have time to work with people who aren't nice, you know, or I don't have the, the wish, you know, life's too short for that. So, you know, in the music business, it's, it's really important. I know that people that make their mark are, on me are the people who are a little extra helpful, enthusiastic that, you know, are, you know, you don't wanna be surrounded by sycophants, you know, but, it's just important to be a congenial, warm person, as you can tell these people are. I don't know, Mike and Anne, if you have, if you can attest to those things. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I would just, the last thing I would say is, um, and I don't mean this, I don't mean this to cast a, a dark shadow over graduates who are about to walk out of the door, but the, the truth is success is the exception in the music industry, just like it's the exception in, in Hollywood or, you know, any other sports or whatever. I mean, it really is all those magazine cover stories that you see, you're not seeing the 99.9% .9 who are not on the magazine cover who make up the majority of, of the industry, you know? So um, again, I'm not saying that the cast to make things even more difficult, but just, you know, the perspective is really important. It really is. Yeah, even when there was a lot less content, and like I said, in the heyday of records, and only one out of 12 were making their money back. So it's like you can't, you know, so you, that says it pretty much right there. And now there's so much more music out there. Well, one thing I would say as advice to young students is look for mentors. Maria had great mentors. I've had great teachers who became mentors to me. I think look for people 
people like to help. And if you're trying to figure out what to do with your career, ask people for help. You know, people ask for advice. You know, I talked to my son about this. He's looking for an internship in the summer. And I said, don't be afraid. The phone is your friend. That's my, I don't know, maybe in these days, everybody wants email, but in my world, if I pick up the phone, people respond more quickly, you get more done. Um, call people, ask for help, email them, ask for help. Try to set up an appointment just to get information. It, if you don't know what the next step is, you've got teachers at NEC who are willing to help. You've got a lot of people who would like to help you be successful. It's hard, but getting a mentor, I think is a great way to think about it too, getting a bunch of mentors. And that's great advice. Yes, Absolutely. it is. Well, on that note, I think that's a great place to close. Thank you so much to you three, Maria, Mike, and Anne. And just a note for those watching, Maria has been in residence with us at NEC this week and has been working with NEC students. And there's going to be a concert uh, of NEC Jazz performing her music, which is going to air next week, one-time concert. So you have to be there to see it. Uh, we're really excited for that. And just a special thank you again. You all have been so generous with your time. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Drew. Nice to see you, Maria and Mike. It's great to see everyone. And thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys. Airing, just one thing. I think it's, isn't it airing tomorrow night or is it a week from tomorrow? A week from the 10th. Week. Oh, it is. Oh, okay. Okay. I mean, the band sounds great, by the way, everybody. So <laughs> I'm excited. NEC students are amazing. I have to say, I'm always Yeah, so they are. It's going to be really fun. Okay, thanks everybody. Take care. Thanks, thanks guys. guys.